mean, I asked this of Matt Pottinger when he was on our show. Um, it, one thing that the book The Boiling Moat talks about is like we need to increase the defense spending, just like you've been saying. And because it's a election year this year, talking about defense spending is not exactly a popular, you know, like talking point in terms of elect me and we will spend more on the military. So how do you think that U.S. officials or politicians can talk about this in a way that makes sense to the U.S. people? I think it starts with with leveling with the American people the, the situation that we're in. Uh, we've entered a new period of Cold War. Um, and I mean that in a very specific sense. You know, a Cold War is a is a you know hostile rivalry between great powers, each possessing nuclear weapons, which forces the competition into a variety of other sectors like the economy, uh, you know, uh, into propaganda, uh, into technology, um, and it forces us to 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 do things uh, and take more seriously sort of the geopolitical uh, stakes. That we find ourselves in, because it's really a, it's really a battle over how does the world work, right? How does the international order work? Um, and and we've not, you know, at least I haven't seen uh, American political leaders level with the American people that that's the situation we're in. In fact, what we're in right now is, you know, numerous leaders uh, and 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 officials adamantly saying that we're not in a cold war, right? That this is not happening. Uh, that China and Russia are not allies, right? And and it would seem to me that that is objectively false on both counts. I mean, Xi Jinping and Putin made pancakes together. I mean, if that's not friendship, I don't know what is. Um, why do you think that the U.S. officials are saying we're not in a Cold War? Is this trying to signal to China? Or like, is this like, are they, they do they actually believe we're not in a Cold War? Yeah, I, so, I mean, I mean, part of it is, I think, a, a, a desire to um, that if you don't admit something is happening, maybe it won't become real, right? Um, that that you know, as long as you as long as you ignore it, maybe the problem will go away and it can resolve itself, and we can find a a, a more mutually beneficial relationship. Um, I think part of it is is that there is a there is a a, a deep aversion to the idea that that we would go back into a period uh, of international affairs that um, that many of us saw as quite dangerous. And, and I think it absolutely was. Um, but it's 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 the least worst option for us right now. I mean, the reality is, is that we are in a deeply hostile rivalry with the threat of war erupting and ongoing conflicts that we are already in that are that are sort of allied to the PRC. Um, and, and if we don't become serious about that and communicate to the American people about those realities, um, the, the risk for surprise and disaster goes way up because you're simply not preparing yourself for the kinds of things you're actually facing. Um, and so I think that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a dangerous situation to be in. You know, the time to have made this argument was probably in the spring of, of, of 2022. Um, and folks didn't make that argument then. And so it's becoming, it becomes much more difficult as they get closer to an election. Um, so I, I'm, I, you know, I, I know it's hard uh, and that's not what people want to hear, but I think it's, I think it's better for us to sort of deal with reality as it is than to pretend that it doesn't exist. Yeah. So, you know, in the, in the, I guess call it the first cold war between the U S and the Soviet union, the world was basically splitting up into these geopolitical blocks, right? And at the time, we called it first world, that is, you know, the West, right? The first world, second world, unaligned, and third world, which was the communist countries. Um, well, but what are we... Second world. Or sorry, communist second world, third world were like the... What we now call, I guess, developing countries. Right, right. But well, it's... Well, it's Yeah. Well, so, and now now it's called the global... So like, what are the geopolitical blocks that we're seeing today? Are they the same? Are they different? Well, I mean, I, I would contend that that we now have essentially those same that that same three world model. Um, I think we have a global West, right? I mean, it, yeah, the idea of the term West is a little bit tough 
just because we're talking about countries that exist around the world, um, you know, primarily Europe, um, the democracies of, of, of East Asia, Australia, North America. I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of the global West. I mean, technically, Japan is really far west of the United States. Exactly. Yes. And, and possibly just north if you consider Guam. Yeah. 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 So, you know, the directionality obviously is not the thing here. It's, it's, it's a concept. Uh, you know, it's a stand in term uh, that, that, that we've chosen to use. And I think I, I would say that, that we've also got a global east. Um, and increasingly, that is the PRC, the Russian Federation, the Iranians. Um, certainly the North Koreans, um, probably you would put the Pakistanis, uh, in there, or maybe they are in the global South. I mean, you know, a couple of these will, will sort of sit on boundary lines. Uh, and then we have a, when we have a global South, um, which in many ways aligns with, with what had been the third world or the non-aligned movement, um, of, of the first cold war. And we're now back into that same set of of dynamics, um, you know, it's not exactly the same. Um, there are difficulties with with sort of making analogies, but I would argue that that it's a mistake for us to ignore the category of Cold War, and it's the, and it's a mistake for us to ignore the categories of these different blocks. It's a heuristic to think about how these things work, uh, as opposed to the as opposed to a direct analogy. To what we went through between 1947 and 1991. Um, and so, uh, if the U.S. were to sort of in a in a whole of government way look at uh, our situation as a Cold War, and as we're in this geopolitical block uh, versus you know the, the China, Russia, North Korea, Iran block, how would that change things from the way they are now? Well, I think it 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 would sort of settle our minds on on the idea that that um, that there is this this budding division between Moscow and Beijing. Um, I think we've got to to sort of set that aside. That that is likely not going to materialize any time while Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin are alive. Um, you know, those two leaders have likely made a set of conclusions about their own alignment that is going to be very hard to dislodge. Um, and therefore, we probably need to be viewing them and treating them as a block so that they each suffer the, the consequences of each other's actions. Right, right now, um, even though we've imposed some sanctions on Chinese companies that are providing material support to Russia's war machine, the Chinese economy, while not doing very well, is not necessarily suffering all of the consequences that would come from China's almost full-scale support of the Russian war effort. And so therefore they get to sort of hedge between the two. Um, and, and we should probably be pushing them closer together right now rather than pretending that they are still split.